So I'd like to welcome you physically and virtually to Bexhill Museum. It's lovely to see you all here on this sunny afternoon. I'm Julian Porter. I'm the curator of the museum, and I've been rummaging around in the archives to find some photos, documents, press cuttings that hopefully you haven't seen too much of before. I've given a number of talks on the Delaware Pavilion in the past, and I can show you this is a new one. I had a very, very long one, and everyone told me that was much too long, so I cut it back, and everyone said that's much too short. So I put <laughs> some new stuff into the cut down ones to try and spice it up a little bit. So what we're doing today is part of BBC Arts, uh, Art That Made Us Festival. So hopefully you've seen some of these excellent programs. They are on BBC Two at 9 p.m. every Thursday. And one of the episode features Bexhill, the Delaware Pavilion, and our shared patron, Eddie Izzard. So that episode, assuming we haven't streamed them all already, will go out on Thursday, the 19th of May. So the museum's contribution is to really let you see in a bit more detail some of those documents that we've used as reference material. I'm going to talk for about an hour. So if you have any questions, we'll deal with those at the end. And if you're watching virtually, if you can put them in the Q&A section and we will try and deal with those at the end. So it's about half past two now. I'm going to speak through to about half past three, assuming that's about 30 seconds a slide. I've got a few slides. That'll take us half past. And then we'll have about half an hour, 20 minutes at the end for questions and discussions. Hopefully you can all see me and hear me quite clearly. Is this about the right level? To yeah. We have me shouting. And... Assuming I've not forgotten anything, we'll have a look at some slides. Brilliant. Now, assuming I can master the technology, we can begin. So a little bit about Bexhill on Sea. We are a very famous but not enormous seaside resort that developed at the end of the 19th Century. So here you can see us in 1910 doing what most people wanted to do when they came to Bexhill, go and enjoy the beach. And the most famous building in Bexhill is the Delaware Pavilion that was built and opened during 19. 35, and it is the first example of an international modernist building to be put up in Great Britain and the first building to use a welded steel frame. So this brings a new architectural style to Bexhill and indeed the rest of the country. So it's really the iconic building for Bexhill. So as a it's like a 1936 Southern Railways poster here showing it rather idealised. We know it's right at the start of the Delaware Pavilion's life because we can see some interesting features such as the linking pergola on the right hand side that would have connected the building to the seafront and the seafront structures that were never completed. And also there are games nets on the roof. So these are features that we only see right at the start of the building's life. Bexhill, well, we have been here a very long time. We had dinosaurs to start with. The first written reference to Bexhill is in 772 AD. King Orf Offer of Mercia came down. He gave the land to the Bishop of Selsey. The bishops later became the bishops of Chichester. They were the landowners for hundreds of years, and eventually the land passed to the Dukes of Dorset. And from them, we have the Delaware family. And it's the seventh Earl Delaware that develops the resort in 1883. He's getting on in years, and it's his young, energetic son, Gilbert, eighth Earl Delaware, that does a huge amount to promote the resort and put it on the map. 
He does this through new things such as the cycle boulevard on the seafront. So here we see the cycle chalet and this later upgraded to motor races too. And here we can see the 8th Earl Delaware standing on the left at the first British motor car race, the 19th of May, 1902. And virtually everybody with a motor car in the country came to Bex Hill on that day. And most, well, all of the British press and some of the European press were here as well. So this is the event that really puts Bex Hill on the map, May 1902. This is the town's first pavilion. This is the 8th Earl's Curzel at the start of Delaware Parade. You can see the Delaware gates, so the Earl can symbolically close off the parade. It was his private land, which is why he was able to have motor racing on it, although in practice they hardly ever closed the gates. And he built what was going to be a pier, but they only ever built the landward Section. So it's, it's the entrance to a pier, but without a pier behind. The money ran out, and I think there was a little bit of nervous, nervousness about day trippers coming over from Hastings and Eastbourne. This was a very high class resort. We wanted the best quality people to come down. It wasn't for day trippers, it was people with cash to come and stay for a long time and spend as much money here as possible. And as business plans go, that's not. A bad one. Not very inclusive, but it's all about trying to make some money for the Delaware estate. So the Curzon is Bex Hill's first entertainment pavilion, built in 1896, and it survives until 1936. So it only overlaps the Delaware by one year. It also introduces a interesting style of architecture to Bex Hill's seafront. Orientalism. This mixture of styles from North Africa, India, all come together. So it's the domes and minarets that Bexel's seafront is famous for. So this is the Cairo on the seafront, where we see the architectural trend go from the Curzon to the west. And that keeps going to the colonnade, which opens in 1911. Now, things are somewhat complicated by the very welcome presence of the Maharajas of Kuch Bahar, which led to all sorts of local myths about the Maharajas bringing this style of building with them. They didn't, and I'm sure they were quite amused by the style of architecture. They only built one thing in Bex Hill, and that was the memorial fountain on the site where the Delaware Pavilion was later constructed. So this is Jitendra Maharaja Kuj Bahar about to open the memorial fountain in memory of his father in Bexel in 1913. So this is the site on which the Delaware Pavilion was later constructed, known either as the Horn or the Coast Guard Cliffs. A very important site, this is where Martello Tower 46 was located, part of a string of defensive towers to keep Napoleon's army out. Behind it was a Coast Guard station, in practice used more for keeping the troublesome local smugglers under control rather than keeping the French army out. And they had a flagstaff there as well. So in the early days, this was where people gathered for big civic events, royal events, entertainment in the town. There was this tendency to head towards the flagstaff at the Coast Guard station for the townspeople's entertainment, as opposed to what was going on later on in Old Delaware's estate on the other side of Bex Hill. And here we can see a postcard showing the Coast Guard site It's about 1908, and if you look carefully, the colonnade isn't there. At this point, Delaware Parade or East Parade, which was built in 1883, existed. West Parade, which was built in uh, 1886, is there, but there's nothing in between. It's not until 1910 that Central Parade is built and the two parades all join up. So this is still the modern version of the Coast Guard station. These are the 1904 Coast Guard cottages. 
with the Metropole Hotel in the background, the first rowing club, and that very important flagstaff where people got together for fun. This is after the construction of Central Parade. It's very clearly 1910, because Central Parade is there, but the colonnade doesn't exist at this point, and there's just a temporary bandstand put in. So really, part of what we think of the colonnade is Central Parade, and it's really the landward section that is the colonnade proper. And this wonderful postcard, this must be very shortly after the colonnade was opened in 1911. Just see the jumble of Orientalist buildings in the background. So we can see people walking along the deck of the colonnade. One of the main buildings is 22 Marina Court Avenue, which is up there. And that is where the Maharaja of Kuch Bihar came for his health. It didn't work. He died there. So at the point where this postcard was taken, poor old Ailey Maharaja of Kuch Bihar was in there not feeling very well. And if you look carefully, I think there's a member of the Maharaja's uh, group in this photograph as well. So all sorts of interesting things going on in 1911, and then just stepping over the dog in this one. And this is the official opening of the colonnade, the 24th of July, 1911, and a very important person doing it. This is Earl Brassy. He was mayor of Bexhill. So the Brassy family, very important contributors to the history of Bexhill. And it is his grandson, the ninth of Delaware, that was the champion behind the Delaware Pavilion project. And of course, it's after him that the Delaware Pavilion is named. So hundreds of people gathered here to see the colonnade opened. Everybody was very excited, very proud of the very beautiful Orientalist colonnade. But almost as soon as the paint was dry, people were asking for an enclosed all-weather pavilion or winter garden to complete the project. Because this was fine if you were in the band, because you had a roof over your head. If you're in the audience, you have to take your chances with the prevailing wind, the rain, and the seagulls. So this is Annie Lady Brassy, Earl Brassy's late wife, aboard their steamship, the Sunbeam, aboard which they traveled all around the world in the 1870s and 1880s, having all sorts of adventures, Annie collecting things to put into her museums. And with her is a small girl, and this is Muriel Brassy, later Muriel Sackville. So she marries Gilbert, 8th Earl of Delaware, in 1891, and we have the two families coming together. So this is July 1900. Ethel Delaware has come back from a second South African campaign, meets up with his family. While he's been away, Muriel Brassy has given birth to her brand, their third child and only son. And this is the future ninth Earl Delaware. This is at the Brassy family home, Norman has called in Catsfield. But I'm sorry to say that by Christmas 1901, the Earl had run away with an actress and refused to come home. So by, by July 1902, Muriel had enough of him and she divorces him and she gets custody of all three children and she brings them up as radicalised Brassies. Now the Brassies started off as liberals, Muriel becomes even more radical, she becomes a socialist, she becomes a suffragist and also a theosophist. So there's some very strange religious beliefs coming in as well. And all of this has a great influence on the young Herbrand, future ninth Earl uh, Delaware. Now, I don't know if this is too small to see, but we've got to look at some of these families. So we have Sackfields. We have Wests, we have Sackville Wests, 
and we have brasses. And our sack for West, our line through the seventh Earl Delaware, he was sack for West, but he got a bit bored of that and went back to being playing sack. So it is all very, very complicated. The um, point I really want to bring your attention to is going way back in time, the third Baron West, who became governor of Virginia, and in 1610, he rescued the Jamestown colony, which had run into all sorts of problems in America. They'd run out of food, they had a terrible time, they were all eating each other. So he turns up with some food, gets them going again, they make him governor, and they decide to name the state of Delaware after him. So this is where we resolve that issue of how the Delaware Pavilion is named. If we take it from the family name, the pronunciation should be Delaware, although traditionally everyone in Bexhill pronounces it Delaware. So there's what you should say, and there's what everybody has literally said. So I won't go too much further into this argument, but we will be using Delaware because that's the family name. So coming back to architecture, if you can't get the building you like, make it out of ice and sugar. So this is about 1913, going back to that move to have an all-weather pavilion, a winter garden attached to the colonnade site, and various schemes put forward. First of all, they made a sugary colonnade, and they thought, we want something else to go with this, and they made a sugary pavilion to go with this. So about 1913, everyone would wanting and expecting a new pavilion, but they were expecting it to be in an Orientalist style. So this is what I think a lot of people would have been expecting from the Delaware Pavilion. They went as far as to do some Edwardian Photoshop and get the Torquay Pavilion and photographically drop it in behind the colonnade. So again, in 1913, this is what everybody was hoping for. This is what everybody was expecting. And if you look very carefully, you can also see the Maharaja Kuch Bahar's memorial fountain there. By 1930, things hadn't moved on enormously. So Mayor Turner Lang wanted a new entertainment hall, a new marina hall, and he worked with a firm of Tubbs and Messer to come up with this plan. Again, it's a bit frilly, not at all modernist. Probably two things to be said for this, one of which is it preserved the Maharaja's memorial. It didn't require that to be moved. And it also had a museum in it as well. So I quite like that. So there's two, two ticks in its favour. It didn't go anywhere. Well, his plan didn't go anywhere. But when the Ninth Earl Delaware came in as mayor of Bexhill and started to get behind this idea of a new entertainment hall, Tubbs and Messer do come back with another scheme. So, Bex Hill in the 1930s, what was it like? I can't find anything better than this cartoon to sum up what 30s Bex Hill was like. So this is from the Daily Express, 1932, and essentially it is largely composed of gouty kernels. So gouty kernels make up a large part of the population of Bex Hill, all sorts of fun, in this cartoon. And also like this, there's a, there's a confused antiquarian there because the Bexel Corporation used BC as their logo. So that's confusing the antiquarian there. So um, yeah, an interesting mix of people. So slightly cruel, but not too far from the truth. Our Nightfield Delaware doesn't really fit into this gouty kernel mode. Um, because of this very different background he had, he had lots of different ideas, very different from anybody that had come before. He was the town's first socialist mayor. And during his mayoralty, one of his ideas was to have a youth council and a boy mayor. So this is 1934 with the town council and its sort of youth shadow council there outside the Bexhill West Railway Station. And here he is, Bexhill's Socialist, suffragist, theosophist, vegetarian mayor. So very different in some ways from his father, completely different 
politically, but also he, he liked new things and he liked innovation as well. Very well connected. So this backs into the 30s, it's a very different world. So this is the Coon Beach Hotel that was run, built and run by the Delaware family. Diana, Diana Delaware, his wife, was the manager of the Coon Beach Hotel, and this is where they lived in Bexhill. And the Prime Minister here, Ramsey McDonald, just popped down to stay with his friend Earl Delaware at Coon Beach. So we don't get very many visits from important politicians. So in the 30s, this was quite common that the Prime Minister would come down and stay with Delaware at the Coon Beach. Really interesting character, Nightclub Delaware. So in 1939, he goes over to Paris to give a speech and basically lays it all out his views of what's going wrong in Europe and the threat that the Nazis are posing this existential threat to culture, saying here in this speech that you know you have a right to read any books you like, see any art you like, and should be exposed to all cultures, that nothing should be excluded. So a very far-thinking character. So back to the Colonnade site. This is 1930. The land had belonged to the Coast Guard. They'd sold it off. That was the town council's opportunity to buy it. And certain things had to go to development, including the Paul Maharaja's memorial there. The Bexwell 1930 development plan gives us our first inkling of something modern. Even slightly postmodern here, I think it almost looks like a supermarket branch there. It's got quite a different plan there. So this music pavilion and a large band enclosure, 1930, this was a town plan. So this was taken very seriously. Um, so Adams, Thompson and Fry, they come along, they do this little bit of work. They also put in for the big prize. So 1933, uh, with the help of Reba and the Architects Journal, a competition is held to design the new Marina Hall for Bex Hill. And virtually every architectural practice in the country enters this competition. This is during the Depression, everybody wanted this contract. So they come back, they put together a rather worthy attempt here, but of course they don't win the competition. Famously, it is Eric Mendelssohn and Serge Chimaev that get the contract to build the Delaware Pavilion. So the competition is 33, it's announced 34, and it's built during 30. Five. So they have come across from Europe, bringing a new architectural style with them. So Eric Mendelssohn, German Jew, he can't stay in Germany. So he comes across and joins up with Chimaev to form a practice here. But of course, this is the building style that they are used to. Delaware has stipulated that they want a modern building. And I think in many ways, this is why they win and what, why their design is thought to be head and shoulders over everybody else's. The other firms are used to building in more traditional styles and they're having to attempt a modernist building. But this is actually the building style that Mendelssohn and Chimaev are used to. So they're in that element here. And I think it really shows through in the successful competition bid. Now, this should be very familiar. This is the model that we have here in the museum, built in 1934. Um, there was an inquiry into the project for it to move forward. It was felt that a lot of people had difficulty interpreting architectural plans. So the best thing to do was to get Mendelssohn and Chimaev to make a model so everybody could see very clearly what they were going to get. And this was very, very popular. Now, if you look very carefully, it's not exactly the same as the building that we now have. None of the seaward parts of the building are there now. So this is very ambitious. They were going to redesign Central Parade. The colonnade was going to go. There was going to be a circular swimming pool. There was going to be a mini pier with diving board. And also, if you've got very sharp eyes, you might also see the statue as well, that was all part of the project. And then we have this linking pergola that connected the seaward section 
back to the main building, and that was glazed and enclosed, so you could move backwards and forwards from the seafront to the Delaware without getting blown around. Now, they ran out of money, so essentially what they did is they dropped all the seafront parts of the building and just put in the main building. Opinion was slightly divided about what we were going to get. Um, a lot has been written about people in Bexhill not liking international modernism, not understanding it, and there's certainly an element of that. But what really worried people was the cost of the building. So I think in, in practice, it's the cost that got a lot of people jittery rather than the architectural style. So this is from the Bexhill Independent newspaper, July 1935, and they had quite a strike campaign against, they couldn't do much to stop the building, but they didn't like the idea of a statue because that would cost a thousand pounds and they didn't like the idea of the swimming pool either. And all sorts of different things, all sorts of designs that they might get, which they're not going to like, but at the end of the day, it's going to cost a thousand pounds. So they didn't want anything at all. It's probably just as well they didn't know what they were going to get because <laughs> our statue was quite something. This is our lost goddess. This is Frank Dobson's Persephone, this enormous statue that we should have had. I think we should, should still have her back outside the Delaware Pavilion. So this is the Greek goddess, goddess of the underworld and summer holidays. So she spends half a year in Hades, the other half of the year in Bexhill on sea, swimming on the beach. <laughs> so we do need to get her back. So the site was cleared at the very end of 1934. The foundations went in. As soon as they hit 1935, they get building with a vengeance. And here we see the steel girders and the welded steel frame, this new construction technique that was quicker, cheaper, and lighter than a riveted steel frame for all sorts of reasons I don't understand, so I'm not going to try to explain here. And again, at the Coon Beach Hotel, Earl Delaware and Diana Delaware have another important visitor, the king and queen just pop in to see them at the Coon Beach. And the king sees our model, our 1934 model of the pavilion, and is so intrigued that he requests an unofficial tour of the building site. So off they go, they put their wellies on, or whatever the equivalent was, and they march around the Delaware pavilion site with Earl Delaware showing the king and queen what was going on in Bexhill on sea. So, 1930s Bexhill on sea, nothing sleepy going on here at all. The famous welded steel frames, again, this is in the Depression, so a big element of the project was to create work. This wasn't just a sort of a, a, a free project because Earl wanted to, to, to do something. Everybody wanted an entertainment hall. The economy, the tourist economy, the percent boards of town was flagging a bit. So they needed a sort of shot in the arm to get the town economy going again. And I think it was Knightville's idea that if you're going to do it, do it well. So get a best possible architect to put in the best possible building using the latest techniques. It's our welded steel frame, creating lots of local employment as well. So the town silver band turned up. So this is 6th of May, 1935. So this is George V's silver jubilee. And here they are getting ready to lay the jubilee plaque, which is now at the bottom of the south staircase at the Delaware Pavilion. So old Delaware and Diana and the children are there. So there's the oldest boy, the next Earl, that's 10th Earl Delaware. Lady Kitty and the small boy there is Harry, so that's the younger son, who sadly was killed during the Second World War. And this is the official opening, 12th of December 1935. So in the course of the year, they have the whole building complete and ready 
to open. I think everybody still thought they were going to get their swimming pool and diving board at this, this point. I think it was only later in 36 that people realised that they weren't going to get the seafront section. But everybody turns out to welcome the Duke and Duchess of York to open the new, no longer called the Marina Hall, it's now called the Delaware Pavilion as tribute to the work of the ninth Earl. So a little bit later on, Duke of York becomes George VI and Duchess of York, the Queen Mother. So they come down and get all the people of that are those. Some other interesting artistic content on the inside. This is inside the restaurant. So this is Edward Wadsworth's mural that was put in the, in the cafe and is, is still there. It was restored in the 50s. It suffered quite badly. The story I was being told is that the waitresses there used to pin the orders onto it because it's on some sort of a pinboard. So it has to be sort of frequently touched up because it had lots of holes in it. So I don't think anybody pins anything onto it anymore. And of course, you can also see some of Avla Alto's wonderful modern tables and chairs in there. So there's modern furniture to go with this modern building. And special uniforms, these adaptations of the borough uniforms, because this is a civic development. As Earl Delaware said, if it, it would, if it would pay private enterprise, it would pay the town. So this is part of Bexhill Town Council. So they had modified town council uniforms. And then saying the manager, Mr. Rhodes, is there. And the cheeky chap is sitting or standing next to him. Uh, to our, our left on his right is Leslie Steen, who started work there during the construction phase and stayed working at the Delaware Pavilion until 1970. And here we are. So you can see here some games nets on the roof. So we know this is early. We can also see some interesting planting. There's all sorts of different flagpoles and trees put in. In some ways, the, the only way that Madison and Chimaev's design didn't quite meet the brief is the brief did specify there were to be vertical elements within the scheme. And it's a very horizontal building. So there were certain flagpoles and things added on to meet the brief, but very much bolted on. And of course, Dobson's statue Persephone would have been another one of those vertical elements going in. But it's interesting to see the plant in here. And again, the, the classic bicycle parking technique there, of just dumping it on the paper. It's a lovely advert here from 1936. We're talking about the new Delaware Pavilion. So we can get some wonderful Southern Railway posters to promote the resort. It's been described as the people's palace. It was very much for the townsfolk as well as for the holiday makers. It has this balance of having to encourage people in, but also has to be welcoming for the townsfolk as well. In a way that the Eightfold Delaware's curves the water, and that was specifically for wealthy holiday makers. This was for the people of Bexhill as well as our visitors. The Earl was offered the freedom of the borough of Bexhill in 1936. There's only a handful of people who have ever been granted this. And to everybody's shock, he declines it because he felt that if there were still any objections to the building. And again, I think the objections were larger to cost rather than the architecture. He said he didn't think he would write to accept the freedom of the borough. So to everybody's great disappointment, he, he declined the freedom of the borough in 36. And we get some reviews of the building. So we have the star there, uh, who I've the last little panel there. Uh, they can now see it as a credit to Bexhill. I should say it is the brightest spot on the south coast. And also the Daily Mirror there from 1937, where they actually find somebody who doesn't like the style. So there are, there are some comments. Um, a gentleman who describes it as, an, as elephantine in size and ugly in design suggests that glass tanks with live fish caught locally should be placed inside. Mm -hmm. And they conclude their saying, uh, if you must change it, why not knit a giant tea cosy 
place it over the top and disguise the whole building as a teapot. <laughs> That's just a slightly sarcastic sort of bit of editorial comment on the end. There. So uh, even at the time, some of the people who found fault with the building, even, they were made fun of as well for being Philistines. So the Daily Mirror Eight, which was a dance troupe who did keep fit, they appeared in Beck's Hill a number of times before, but from 1936 onwards, they're here every year. And this is just before the start of World War II. They come down and they do one of these keep fit demonstrations, which you sit in a deck chair and watch, which sounds like a very sensible way to do keep fit. They would challenge people to come and join in and roundly thrash them. You couldn't actually compete with them on any level. But you can see thousands of people gathered around. So this is just before World War II, the pavilion going very, very well. What could possibly go wrong? The terrace here with some interesting design features. I'm rather fascinated by these lamps. They seem to be freestanding because in some other photographs we can see them sort of put in the corners. They must have had an internal power supply and I don't know what that was. There was no bandstand to go with the Delaware Pavilion because the colonnade had a bandstand. And also there was a system for piping music from the auditorium to the terrace. So there were speakers there. So you could listen to the band playing in the theatre from the terrace. And I think that is what is going on here. They're not watching something specifically, they're sitting and they're listening to the music being piped out to them. But it's a stunning image of the Delaware Terrace in 36. Also in 36, in July, there is the Concourse d'Elegance. This tradition of motor racing did continue. It wasn't practical to actually literally race around the streets anymore, but with that evolved in the 30s into car shows. And just once in 1936, the motoring heritage and the architectural heritage of Bexhill coincided with the Concourse being held at the Delaware Pavilion on the Terrace. The event that really put the Delaware Pavilion on the map, and it was an enormous success, was Paul Robeson's concert in 1936. Um, possibly the only person more left-wing than Nightfall Delaware in Bexhill that evening, but Paul Robeson came down and it really established that the pavilion worked. And people were saying, well, it's too big, you can never fill it. They were overflowing. They had to put seating on the stage for this event to meet the capacity of the audience. And they basically, after this, were saying, we didn't actually build it quite big enough. So this is really the artistic event that proves the concept of the Delaware Pavilion. 1937, we have another local character. We have Grey Owl, which at this point... Nobody realizes Archie from Hastings, who <laughs> had this character of a Canadian industry. Uh, much as we made the fact that he, he, he was a hoax, he wasn't who he pretended to be. But, but he did a lot of good by getting the early environmental movement going. And you can see from the headlines there, if he comes over here and he tells everybody off of what we're doing in Britain and get, tries to get people to think more about the environment and nature. So some really important events, but the Delaware isn't making money. In, in some ways, it may have been an unreasonable expectation, but it would have done. This was really, should have been thought of as a lost leader. This was the thing that would get people to come and spend money in the rest of town, but the pavilion itself wasn't making any money. The famous journalist, Hannah Swaffer, comes down to annoy everybody in Bexhill, being given the ground for sort of here and writing about threatening to become mayor of Bex Hill. And the little quote at the end here is quite interesting. The Delaware Pavilion stands on the seacoast, a challenge not only to other towns, but a challenge to its own. So this idea that it, it's stirring things up in Bex Hill just a little bit. The coronation, of course, the king had previously come down to open the Delaware Pavilion in 35. So 37 was a big year for Bex. And you can see those three flag staffs that bit put in. That's our vertical element coming into the design. 36, the Kurzweil is 
demolished. And incidentally, this is where a Earl Delaware had met the actress, Miss Turner, who he'd run off with, which split the Delaware family. So when it comes to Ninth Earl Delaware and Corporation buying back the land, one of the first things they do is, is pull it down. I think, I don't want to make too much of it's done out of spite because that, that this is great for the family. It's more that this was the last bit of ecstasy from in private hands and they didn't want to maintain a rival building to the Delaware Pavilion, so they didn't need it because they had the pavilion. So that goes, and our brand new and shiny Ritz Cinema, another building with a steel frame, is just appearing there. So things moving on the best here. This is the Information Bureau in the pavilion in 38. So very much becoming the focus, becoming the centre of Bex Hill. Because of the history of the town, it was very much divided between the Delaware estate and the rest of the town. It's, it's very difficult to actually sort of pin down where the centre of Bex Hill actually was. But I think in some ways the information bureau in the Delaware helped. Some very high-tech equipment going in. So some of the switch gear here to operate a very sophisticated stage lighting. It was state of the art the theatre, so I'm going to be very proud of this. And of course, here we are. This is the Bexhill Museum Association holding their lectures in the hall at the Delaware Pavilion. I can't see our curator, Henry Sargent, in there, but presumably he's at the front giving the talk, and this is, this is, this is the membership just posing there. I'm sure they all look very pleased to have that photograph taken. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a classic image of the pavilion in its prime, again, possibly 35, certainly pre-war with all the features such as the Lincoln Pergola, the games nets and the awnings, all those little details that are lost during the war. But of course the war comes along just during the phony war period. Now, of course, with the troubles in the world, this is, this is, this is, quite worrying and we see sandbags and, and important artistic buildings being defended. But bombs hadn't started falling on Bexhill at this point, so it was still perceived as fun. So we have the cafe start from the Delaware and children on holiday filling sandbags to create a air raid shelter around the colonnade. Now you weren't supposed to take photographs in World War II, so we're very lucky that Laurie Dre broke all the rules, took some photographs so we can see what Bexhill was like during World War II, specifically the winter wartime of 1940s. It's one of Laurie's photographs showing the pavilion with a rather odd structure running along the front. There's a thing that looks like a, a rather odd wall. I didn't spot this at first. It was pointed out to me by a person who understood World War II things, saying that is probably the blast wall that was put in to allow the theatre to continue to be used. So if a bomb came down, that would stop all the shrapnel and glass being blown into the auditorium. And uh, we know it was there because there are descriptions to it, but we hadn't previously seen any photographs of it. We also used to think that the Delaware Pavilion basically set up shut up shop during World War II, but that's not true at all. It continued to be used and found new uses during the war. So it becomes an emergency rest and meals centre. The army use it, and this meals centre evolved into a British restaurant, which is where you would get a good meal off ration. So a very, very important wartime role. It was damaged. Uh, this is the Metropole Hotel directly next to the Delaware Pavilion. That was hit by a bomb in September 1940. The RAF set fire to it in May 1940, so, so it didn't have a very good time. So it set fire to, but a bomb hits it in 1940, and that bomb also takes out a large part of the Delaware Theatre. There aren't really any good photographs showing the war damage. Uh, the best I can come up with is from Johannes yeah, Schreiner's 1944 um, plan for the repairs to the building, which does actually show the damp that sh shaded the damaged parts of the building and cutting from the Bexel Observer, uh, 10th of April 1948, showing some of the repair work taking place. But very substantial damage. 
Um, the back of the stage is pretty much destroyed and all has to be patched up during the rest of the war. But they still use the building. It doesn't put it out of use. When the pavilion was 50 years old, they ran a series of historical articles about it. And um, remarkably, there was, there was a German airline pilot who came and said, well, he used to be in the Luftwaffe, and they did indeed use it for navigation when they were coming over to drop bombs because the building stood out on a moonlit night and was so different from other buildings in the area. So it was used. There used to be a local story that because it's a German building, it didn't get bombed, well, it did get bombed, but it was used as navigation for the bombers. And also a, a rather strange story about a spy, a German spy, in the Delaware Pavilion, who would draw all the curtains and turn the lights on. So, um, so it's got slightly, it's got into the papers. It's slightly more than an anecdote. I did talk to the person who told the story and said they, they found some evidence. They found some half-eaten sandwiches, which sounds very suspicious to me. A lot of what we know about Bexler during the Second World War comes via Spike Milligan, and specifically his 1971 book, Adolf Hitler, My Part in His Downfall. And it's worth looking at this wonderful quote from Spike from his book. On Bexler's seafront stood the Delaware Pavilion, named after Lord Delaware Pavilion, a fine modern building with absolutely no architectural merit at all. It was open just in time to be bombed. The plane that dropped it was said to have been chartered by the Royal Institute of Architects, piloted by Hugh Cousins with John Betjeman as bomb aimer. So, despite having a lot of fun at the pavilion's expense, but also having a lot of fun in the pavilion. And if you read this out of context, you might think that Spike didn't like the Delaware Pavilion. He loved the Delaware Pavilion. And I think the thing here is we have to slightly separate people's architectural views of the building and the building as an organization, the things that were taking place in there. They're two very separate things. He mentions Rotary Club dances at the Delaware. So this is Bexler Observer, 1941. So this is one of the events that Spike mentions in his book. And have a look at the band up on the stage. There is somebody going complete, completely crazy on the trumpet, or cornet, I think somebody said that's probably a cornet rather than a trumpet. I think this might be young Spike Milligan actually playing at that event at the back of the Delaware in 41. Bexhill is quite depopulated. Um, if you didn't have a good reason for staying in Bexhill after the fall of France, you left because this is where the invasion um, Operation Sea Lion was going to come. We would have been the front line after the fall of France, but there was still a civilian population and there was a large military presence and everybody was using the Delaware Pavilion for food and for fun. And this image shows the British restaurant inside what I think is the auditorium. It's a little bit hard to make out, particularly what's going on in the back. There looks like a brick wall there. What this might be is looking through the glass to the inside of the blast wall. I'm not 100% sure, it's difficult to say, but we may actually be seeing the blast wall there, which of course would have made it safe to use this part of the building um, if there were bombs exploding and hot metal flying around. All sorts of events continue. So uh, 1942, there is a scouts show at the Delaware. You might just be able to see some soldiers at the back of them. I don't know what on earth is going here. I don't know if they have an arson badge in the scouts, but if he likes that, they're in all sorts of difficulty there. But it looks like they are having a wonderful time. Some of the events were purely military. So this is... Um, an event, this is an ENSA event at the pavilion to entertain the troops, and Gracie Fields has come down to put on a performance. So this wouldn't be for the general population, this would have been for the um, services in Bex Hill to get a bit of fun <coughs> and cheer them up. So all sorts of important work going on. Other sporting things going on, uh, boxing in the Delaware Pavilion, which seems a very, fairly strange uh, combination, but they were really interested in putting on what was popular. And if boxing was popular, 
That's what they do. Um, all sorts of strange things happening with Avla Alto's tables being stacked mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. But this was taken so seriously that uh, when Schreiner put his report together in 1944, he actually showed some modifications that could be put in um, to allow boxing to take place. Um, later on in the 70s, there was wrestling going on. I got a wonderful picture of some lady wrestlers, but I thought probably best to leave it out of this talk, save it for another moment. Mm -hmm. So this is Schreiner's report on war damage, dilapidation, suggestions for improvement, and additions for the Entertainment Committee of the Borough of Bex Hill. Now, Schreiner had been part of the group with Mendelssohn Chimek during the build. So he was part of that original build, so it was brilliant to get him back. And he put together this amazing report on what he thought ought to be done to repair the war damage, but also make some additions to the building. And as he was part of that original group with Mendelssohn Chimek, I think we should take this seriously. Obviously, none of this was done, but this, this is an alternate Delaware pavilion. If they had the money to do it, and I think they barely had money to patch a building up, this is what we might have got. This also included a plan to build an entirely new dance hall onto the east end of the pavilion. So a major extension to the site. And it also looks like that linking pergola to the seafront might have come back as well. Post-war 1947, we start to get the big summer shows coming back to Bexhill. So this was bubbling over, which was particularly popular show, and we see some interesting new talent coming through. We have another refugee coming through here. We have a very young Andrew Sachs performing at a problem play. So this is Frieda, this is 1947. We see him in the cast there. And actually the review there he makes special note of his performance. He's going to go on to great things there. So he would have been, I think, 17 at the time. And of course, in 1949, they had all sorts of fun making a film in Bexel. This was released in 1950 as uh, Double Confession, inspiring all sorts of people, including Peter Laurie. So Peter Laurie in Bexel is quite something. And the Delaware becomes the Primrose Bar. So if you can track this film down, it's really interesting to see. So this is the press reports of the film, so everybody going to the Ritz Cinema to see the film and hoping that they will see themselves in it. 1951, Festival of Britain. There were regional Festival of Britain events, and of course, the Delaware Pavilion had its own. So, Night for Delaware was responsible for founding SEMA, the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts, which later developed into the Arts Council. So, SEMA were responsible for the Festival of Britain. So it's quite appropriate we had our Festival of Britain exhibition at the Delaware in 1941. All sorts of interesting things Night Fell Delaware is involved with. Bexhill, absolutely full of schools, a bit of decline post-war, but still a number of large schools left. So this is 1951, so Ancaster House. Lovely picture of the school children there, but also a magnificent photograph of the stage. Also in 1951, huge crowds gathering outside the pavilion to see Starlight Rendezvous. So this was one of the big summer shows. The pavilion also had use of the Edgerton Park Theatre, where the indoor bowling is now. So the local refugee groups would be sort of pushed out to the park during the summer and the big summer shows would move in. So the most popular was Starlight Rendezvous. We have a look at the programme there. In the cast is Freddie Frinson, who is very famous in Europe for his sketch Dinner for One. So he's performing here in Bexel, cheering everybody up during the summer of 1951. Sorry, 1952, this is. 1957, a slightly less slick production being put on. This is the Farliot School of Drama. So it was a drama school run by Christine Porch and Isabel Overton. And they went on to found the Bexhill Costume Museum, which is the other part, the other half of this organization. But they started by putting the training students in drama and putting on shows. So this was, they would have put this program together themselves, which is why it's slightly 
homespun, and nothing homespun about some of the students that were coming through. Uh, so you can see there's a 17-year-old Julie Christie performing here because she went to school in Bexley. Everybody went to school in Bexley, I have to say, because it was just full of schools. Catering for youth, so that's nothing new at the Delaware Pavilion. This is 1957, I love this image. So at the Skiffle concert and the two adults in the front there, I'm not sure they're enjoying themselves as much as the children, particularly the lady there. Um, a penny for their thoughts. Um, there seems to be some doubt uh, the most enjoyed the spirit of the brave new world. So they're putting on a lot of things for youngsters in the pavilion. So sometimes we think it must have been a little bit stuffy post-war, but that doesn't seem to be the evidence of the newspaper. And some more famous young faces here. So this is October 1960. Cliff Richard is there. Slightly concerned there seems to be a young chap on his mobile phone texting somebody in the background. I think that's probably an autograph book or something, something like that in the background. But the show went down, the jazz festival, this went down very, very well. I think the young lady then enjoyed it a little bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> Mob scenes at jazz festival. They're all having a lovely time. Yeah. And Cliff and Eunice Stubbs are back as judges at the fashion parade at the pavilion in 1965. So it's all going on at our Delaware pavilion. And when we were doing the uh, preparation for Art That Made, it's one of the questions I was asked, do you have any menus? What were people eating at the Delaware? The way? And I, I managed to find a 1961 menu, menu there, so we can see uh, what culinary delights you could eat at the pavilion. Lots of fish, lots of fish. <laughs> More royal visits, so Her Royal Highness there down in 1966, a particularly wet and dismal day, but that hasn't put the crowds off. Look at them, they're all enjoying themselves. And look at the ladies outside the door there. I'm a little bit worried about them. I'm glad they've got those doors locked. <laughs> and Bexhill Cat Club, my famous, my, my favourite famous picture. So this is the 19th annual Cat Club at the Delaware in 1967. So presumably they started in 1950. They're going well into the 1970s. The 17th one, they actually managed to get a cat to come along, which I think is quite something. 1963, we start seeing something rather odd. There's an attempt to try and make the building a little bit more what they perceive as cosy, to try and modify it to what most people would expect a public building to be like. And that's not an international style modernist building. So as a new bar goes in, uh, we inherited some of those positive chairs for the museum. You might see some as you walk around. The new bar goes in there. So carpets, flock wallpaper going in. 67, the original library is modified. Um, I think modified is the best word. It's certainly not improved. They want to know what to call the new, new East Wing, and they go for the Elizabeth Room. There's a lovely cutting here. They ask the public what they think. So it's, it's horrible, meaning the title, not the room. So that doesn't go down terribly well. So this is what it was like in 1935. So the idea was the building was there, not just to... Um, not just for recreation and entertainment, to, but to improve your mind as well. So there was a library, and this really didn't last very long. So it was a library and a solarium, and that is converted into the Elizabeth room with this bizarre cladding. Now, my understanding was that there were acoustic problems with it. Basically, it wasn't designed for public speaking. It was a library, so it was designed to be quiet. But this blocked all the windows along the north side of that part of the pavilion. 1970, Leslie Steen retires. It's a nice article. Some really interesting snippets that he wrote about. He, he, he talks about the internet when it started raining inside the Delaware Pavilion. There was problems with the environment and the acoustic dome and condensation forming. So apparently it once actually rained inside the auditorium. Um, and all sorts of minor modifications that we think that the building was perfect when it was put in, but actually he's saying he had to make lots of small adjustments to actually make the building work. So it's really quite an interesting read. 
1969, literally the cracks are beginning to show. Building is falling into decline. There is problems with the steel reinforced concrete. Um, things are not going well. And again, I want to bring back this idea that the, the physical decline of the building doesn't necessarily mean what was going on was declining as well. They were still having a whale of a time inside the building. Here it is, 1970, almost lost under the ivy. 1965, the folk music festival at the Delaware Pavilion. They didn't do too bad. They got a young artist called Paul Simon to come down and perform there. So I think that's probably his first concert in the UK. Somebody told me he performed at New Inn in Sydney first and then came and put on a show at the Delaware. So again, really, really interesting things going on quite quietly in the background. And this, this is the most amazing one. 50 years ago, Bob Marley puts on his first show, first show outside London, you understand, at the Delaware Pavilion. Uh, it, it, essentially, it's a Johnny Nash concert. Barely get to mention Bob Marley then, but there's a fundraiser to provide a swimming pool for Blind Gap School. So this is a sort of a private booking as a fundraiser. So it doesn't get mentioned in the listings for what's on at the Delaware Pavilion because this is somebody just trying to raise a bit of money and making quite a lot of history here. 1972, they get around to installing a lift for the first time. Their original bright idea is to put it in the gap in the south staircase, that little bit in the middle. They want to try and run a little lift ramp through that, but they quite quickly get stopped. A, it wouldn't work, and B, they weren't allowed to. So the lift goes in, in its current position. And Spike is back. Spike terrorising the Bexhill Light Operating Dramatic Society with blots. There he is with his wife looking towards his old observation post at Gary Hill, 1974. He, during, during a break, he gets on stage and sits on stage with the Blood's production of the Flader Mouse, and they have quite a lot of trouble persuading him to leave before the curtain goes up. But here he is with his D battery reunions. The early ones were held in the Manor Gardens, but later on they were held every year until all the gentlemen were too old to actually come along to have that annual get together with various bits of military hardware inside, in the car park inside the Delaware Pavilion. So Spike loved Bexhill. And there was a comment that he probably loved wartime Bexhill rather more than he liked. Modern Bexhill and it was very nostalgic, and so they missed all the buildings and probably missed some of the bonds. But that wartime impression of Bexhill was something that he carried throughout his life. But the pavilion is in trouble. It's falling to bits. It's not getting the support it needs from the local authority. So they asked the public, what should they do with the Delaware Pavilion? So suggestions of bunny girls or dolphins. My first thought is, or couldn't it be anything? <laughs> So again, this idea of turning to dolphin air, I think, oh, it's difficult to get my brain around, I think they're possibly sitting, filling the thing up with water and having dolphins swimming around in it. Anyway, it, it's all crazy, but it gives you some, I mean, I think one of just pull it down. Um, so no love in the pavilion. It's 1981. Fears that the Delaware Pavilion was to be used for sex orgies at the weekend or unfounded. <laughs> no <laughs> refunds for this year. And of course, famously, the King of the Witches, who at that time lived in Bexhill, Old Town, cursed a Blods production. The Blods have this sort of slightly difficult relationship. There are all sorts of things going on. They've either got Spike on stage or they've got the King of the Witches cursing their productions. But as I say, there's no such thing as bad publicity. So they probably ended up with a slightly larger audience due to the Witches curse than they would have had without it. And this is a very famous cutting from the Bexhill Observer. This is where things start to turn around. We have the beginnings of the Pavilion Trust. We have people pointing out that this is an architectural gem and something has gone wrong here. So there's a description here saying that, uh, describing Pavilion's flock and flowery wallpapered interior as looking like a cross between an old person's home and a British rail buffet, and says the Edinburgh room has turned into a poor parody of a provincial Indian restaurant. So that's what they're thinking of the inside. 
But it gets its recognition through a lot of work for the Pavilion Trust, and particularly Jill Tice, it gets back on its feet. And there's a lot of work to do. Some strange things happening in between, including Judge Death turning up at the Pavilion in 1994. Bear with me. And fortunately, Judge Dredd turns up. So these are characters, very famous characters from the British comic 2000 AD, all due to the fact that the artist Ian Gibson used to have a flat in Bexhill. So presumably, this is 1981, that cartoon's quite a bit later, presumably when he wanted some inspiration, his memories of Bexhill Seafront and the Delaware Pavilion come through, but that's, that's my favourite part of the <laughs> Other famous characters coming to Bexhill. 1991, we have the ABC murders. And Agatha Christie, of course, wrote this in 1936. Her daughter, Rosalind, actually went to school in Bexhill because everybody went to school in Bexhill, so she would have known the town. And filming took place during the reconstruction work. So if you see that particular adaptation of ABC Murders, you can see sort of bits of the pavilion are screened off because there was actually scaffolding outside during some of that work. And of course, our patron, and the Delaware Pavilion's patron, Eddie Izzard, worked at the pavilion in the restaurant in the late 1970s, and then came back to support various local charities, first in Sydney, where Eddie's father also did a lot of work, and then later for the Delaware Pavilion itself. So this is 1996, and Eddie reunited there with the cash register that she used when she worked Pavilion. And of course, through Eddie's inspiration, we had Richard Wilson's bus, 2012. Uh, you couldn't miss this, you literally couldn't miss this. And just to conclude, possibly my favourite image of the Delaware Pavilion, icon of that. So this is Frank Sherman's 1947 poster of the Pavilion. So the strap line being Bexhill on the sunny Sussex coast at night. So I'm not quite sure of the logic of that. <laughs> so that brings us on to the end. So um, yesterday I was talking to the education officer who said, well, there's a lot of stuff there and we'll only remember three things. So I thought I'd try and try and sort of sum up the three things to take away. Uh, first, just, just to throwing out the comment that Bexhill is built of contradiction. Bexhill isn't the place most people think it is. It's very strange. There's always two sides to it. Um, it's Delaware, not Delaware. That's probably the really important one, particularly talking to anybody at the Delaware Pavilion. Um, and also this idea that um, it's not that it starts great, then it declines and it builds back up, but that there's one track which is the physical structure of the building. But if you look at what was going on, it goes pretty strong throughout all of that. Even when the pavilion was at its most run down and crumbly, at some of those times, the most remarkable things were going on inside. So.